Welcome to the Writer's Almanac. My name is Garrison Keeler. I'm in my kitchen in New York City, where my wife and daughter and I are spending this pandemic in isolation. It has been now uh, six weeks we've been together and um, still getting along reasonably, reasonably well. One day pretty much like the other. We asked some Poets, we know we issued an open invitation for people to send us poems about the pandemic, an event that seems, even if we don't know why or, or how, it seems um, very profound to me. And I'm interested in what poets may be thinking about this. What we've discovered in these conversations is that America is crowded with with fabulous writers and uh, pe people who write amazing, amazing things. And today we're going to talk to two more of them, who in addition to being fine poets, also have biographies that are utterly unlike what you expect to read in the back page of a book of poems. You know, um, I, uh, you know, majored in English and uh, I taught uh, creative writing at this school and then that school and that school and I won this prize and that prize and uh, this is my uh, 12th chapbook of poetry. That's your typical uh, poet's um, biography but these two are utterly, utterly unlike that. Yvette Vietz uh, Flotten who is with us uh, uh, from Wisconsin living on the Chippewa River, uh, was an Air Force child and uh, spent her first 20 years uh, living anywhere and everywhere in uh, Denver and uh, Nevada, North Dakota, Washington State, uh, France, England, Spain. And then about 40 years ago, she moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin and settled down. and. Uh, and stayed put. Is that kind of a typical life story, Yvette, for, a, for an Air Force kid? It is for, I would say, the majority of kids who grew up that way. They find a place or they find someone, in which case I did, mm -hmm. um, and uh, married, settled down in Eau Claire, and have been here, been very productive ever since. Uh -huh. uh, my wanderlust is still there. It is. So I do travel. Oh, yeah. I, can, I could pack up and go anytime. Where do you, um, where do you want to go, Yvette? Oh, well, I'd uh, certainly uh, consider living in France again. Uh -huh. I'd certainly consider living in Spain again. Um, I'd love to go to Italy. Uh -huh. I've never, I haven't been. Circumstances just never let me get to Italy. Um, and in fact, it led, if, just for a moment, I'll tell you, my mom was born in England and met my father during World War II. Uh -huh. And I never understood when I was growing up why we always had to go visit the relatives in England and why we just couldn't take the two weeks leave and go to Italy or someplace else. And my dad had to explain it to me when I was about, oh, I must have been about 12. He said, we're going to see your mom's family. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. And it was like, yeah, but I still... I'm going to make it to Rome yet. <laughs> it sounds like your father had a higher rank in the Air Force. No, actually, he was a master sergeant. He was. He, he was. He uh, was a B-17 mechanic during World War II, mm -hmm. became a jet mechanic when jets became uh, usual, when they became uh, the, the, the plane that was used, um, mm -hmm. and uh, finished his career as a master sergeant, um, was a great mechanic, um, could fix anything. And, um, and also had a real sense of the natural world. Uh, mechanics and working, making things work out uh, came to him naturally. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was a good fit for him. That childhood is the childhood that I imagined for myself uh, moving around all over. In fact, I spent my first 20 years in one place, mm -hmm. uh, Minnesota, all within um, Hennepin County. So. What, was that confusing for you as a child, or is one Air Force base pretty much like every other Air Force base? <laughs> yes, it is. It's very much. Uh, and actually, I ended up studying history. And uh, the reason that I am so fascinated by the military 
is that when we would travel in, in both England, uh, France, and well, England too, and Spain, the Roman forts that are later became towns mm -hmm. were always laid out in a complete square. And if you look at the way military bases are laid out, 2,000 years later, we're replicating what the Romans knew mm -hmm. and what they did. And mm -hmm. so there's a similarity from place to place, even if it's a different language, a different money system, a different food, um, there's, there are similarities. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't confusing. It was uh, something that I came to accept. The idea of transience was not an odd thing. And uh, so what upset my civilian friends, kids that lived in Laramore, North Dakota, let's say, all their life, to be told that, well, we're leaving in November. We're, we're going, well, we don't know yet where we're going. They haven't told us yet, mm -hmm. but we know we're going. Mm -hmm. And I would see the look of disbelief and uh, discomfort. Mm -hmm. Because they, like you said, imagined themselves in my shoes. Do you still have yes. some friends in Laramore, North Dakota? Well, actually, um, a, a family, yes. A family that we met, we bought eggs from them. They had a farm outside of town, mm -hmm. the Swensons. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're all uh, living in different areas. They're not right there. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, I have wonderful memories of North Dakota, of the flax and the wheat fields. Mm. That's lovely to hear somebody who has lived in Spain and France to say that she has lovely memories of North Dakota. Oh, yeah, we, that's where I learned to swim, in the pool that was built in the Depression. We deeply appreciate your saying <laughs> that. T Tito Titus is with us from his home in uh, Seattle. He's uh, lived all over the place and done everything that you and I wish we had done in our time. Uh, he grew up with a sheep herding family on the Snake River, Hell's Canyon, in um, Idaho. And um, between Hell's Canyon and Seattle, he, uh, he was a farm worker. He, uh, he uh, fought range fires and uh, forest fires. He was a barker in a carnival. He uh, fought in war. I would assume it was the Vietnam War, yes? That's correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. He ran for office. God help him. He uh, was in a theater <laughs> company. He was an artist's model. He wrote environmental reports. He served on the Seattle Design Commission. And now he is uh, 77, living on Capitol Hill in, in Seattle. You've got about uh, 10 memoirs uh, in you uh, to write. <laughs> when I think of... Um, when I think of growing up in a sheep herding family on the Snake River, um, I imagine you as a boy uh, sitting in the shade of uh, a truck with a, with a tent on the box and um, you're reading and there are 500 uh, black faced sheep uh, out on the, on the meadows on the hill and uh, your mother is stirring the beans in the pot over the fire and she is uh, slicing up a possum to put into it and uh, your dad is sitting there with a pint of Jim Beam and uh, he's playing a guitar and um, your mother is speaking to him in Spanish and, uh, and you are dreaming of settling down in Minnesota. No, am I close? Well, uh, you, you had a, a surprising number of uh, points accurate, but there are a few that were not so much. Yeah. What was it actually like? Huh? Did you live in a tent? Uh, often, several months a year, yes. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, with a pack string going from campsite to campsite. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was going to say that, that, that um, the Jim Beam was accurate. Uh -huh. um, but how, about, how about the campfire? It was always so romantic. I, I remember uh, one time uh, sitting on a fence that surrounded it was a makeshift fence made up of, of a series of gates tied together with a bunch of sheep in the middle, maybe 50 sheep in the middle. And um, I was sitting on the top and uh, the gate I was on fell over and 50 sheep ran o over the top of me. It's got a comedy element. My mother thought it had a serious tragedy element. You know, it was, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's not all, uh, you know, roses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where, where did you come in the, in the, in the family? Hmm? Where do you belong in the family? 
where do I belong? Are you an only child? Oh, no, no, but I was for many years. I was then. Uh -huh. uh, I have a brother 10 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father didn't like politics and he didn't like rock and roll. So I went into government and, and politics and, and uh, my brother went into rock and roll. I see. And, and so he's a rock musician and uh, I'm a retired uh, bureaucrat. So did you, uh, did you come to love sheep or to despise them? Um, I'm very proud whenever I see Pendleton Mills products mm -hmm. because they bought our wool. Oh. And, and, and so I, I'd say overall that's a positive thing. I, I would also say that the older I get, the more positive those years become. Mm -hmm. They look better the farther away you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's, um, it's easier to remember, like, like when you get trampled by the sheep, it's hard to see the humor of it. It's, and, and, and now I can look back on it and say, that must have been a heck of a scene. I'd go great in a movie, <laughs> you know? You were a barker in a carnival. Do you still bark or not so much? No, but it's helped at the open mics when I do my poetry. Yeah. Uh, and no, I just did that uh, as a college student for uh, one summer. Uh -huh. Who did you bark for? Well, it was, uh, it was called the Santa Fe Space Race, and it was part of the uh, World uh, Fair in 1962 in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a, it was, it's interesting. It was it, in those days, uh, the, the, the carnival area was called the Gateway. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I got a job promoting one of the, one, one of the uh, stands there. I was, I was right across the street from the guy that could guess your age or weight for $5. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> so how are the two of you doing in this, um, Pandemic. You both you both look um, sane and and uh, yeah. satisfied. Yvette, how are you doing? It's good, good actually. Um, the uh, Wisconsin um, was smart in the early stages of the pandemic, and the governor shut. Well, I shouldn't say that. Shouldn't shut it down, but gave um, safe at home, safer at home orders. People took it seriously. Unfortunately, in the last week, that's been loosened up rather quickly mm -hmm. uh, by the Supreme Court here in the state, and people have literally ripped their masks off and run to the taverns. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not. I'm staying close to home, um, not completely quarantined, not complete isolation. I do go to the grocery store, um, do go pick up my pills at the pharmacy, but that's about it. Um, I'm, I'm married, and my husband and I. Um, we have another house that, well, we're actually in the process eventually of moving from one house to the other. So we have a storage unit. Mm. So we load up some boxes and go to the storage unit mm. and there's no one there. So we can basically have a pretty normal life. Um, we in, we in Minnesota do think of um, Wisconsin as a state of, um, of uh, devoted drinkers. Oh, and, uh, I think, yeah. So when well, we see a car with Wisconsin plates, we, we <laughs> usually give them the right of way. Give them the right of way. Well, um, it does have a huge brewing history. Mm -hmm. The Tavern League is very important in Wisconsin. So mm -hmm. I think the Tavern League, within 10 minutes of the Supreme Court stating that the uh, Safer at Home extension was done, mm -hmm. uh, the Tavern League was on Facebook saying, open up you're ready to go. Mm. And there were people within in, in taverns within two or three hours. So, so where did you meet uh, Mr. Flotten? Pardon did, me? Where did you meet Mr. Flotten? I met him um, in Colfax, Wisconsin. His father was the Lutheran minister. Um, the year my dad was in Thailand. My dad spent a year in Thailand, uh, 68, 69. Um, my mom and I chose to live in Colfax for that year. Um, the base we were at in Washington closed. The Payne Field, um, Tito may uh, know of it. Um, it's now where Boeing has a huge plant. That huge plant on their uh, runway was actually Payne Field at one time. 
And um, so I met my husband in, in high school. We were this juniors is, in high school. This is an amazing life story of, of a young woman who has lived in France and Spain and England, comes to Wisconsin and becomes a Lutheran. <laughs> yes, actually, you're, you're right. That's what happened. <laughs> this could be a Lake Wobegon monologue. Well, I would, and I just tell you, let me just add one little thing so you know I know what I'm talking about. My husband's family are from Swift County, Minnesota, which, so I think of Lake Wobegon as the triangle of Alexandria, St. Cloud, and Painesville. Nice. And I don't know if that's what you think, but when I hear you talk about Lake Wobegon, that's what I imagine. <laughs> okay, well, you're free to imagine whatever you would like. Tito, if I were going to write um, your biography, if I were a hired hand and going to write your biography, uh -huh. I would want to begin this book about your interesting life with one scene that is gripping and that uh, shows you as you truly are. What would the first scene be? Where would it take place? Huh. Getting drunk in Vietnam. Yes? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Who are you in Vietnam? I don't know why I said that, but here I am. I'm stuck with it. That's okay. <laughs> so what did you do in Vietnam? Um, I was a uh, lieutenant, mm -hmm. and I ran a uh, uh, food supply warehouse. Mm -hmm. And we shipped those supplies out to non-divisional troops, meaning like... Um, uh, military advisors, Green Berets, uh, Swift boats. Um, you know, I've, I've sometimes wondered, I was uh, in Vietnam the same time John Kerry was, mm -hmm. and we were both in the Mekong Delta, and he was on those Swift boats. And the thought has occurred to me that I may very well have been shipping food to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it's uh, the timing's perfect for mm -hmm. that. How do you remember those 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 days? Um, frustrating. Um, it, it, uh, just uh, I'd say uh, a great fear of the future. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a newspaper article I saw one time that kind of summed it up. There was a guy waiting in line to uh, get on the airplane to come home. Mm -hmm. Long line of them, and uh, he got picked off by a mortar shell. Mm -hmm. And that's the way a lot everybody felt over there. I think, mm -hmm. you know, um, I mean, I met one guy that served five tours over there. So you did come under fire. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, not in combat, but uh, occasionally we'd have a. Um, uh, um, mortar fire come in and uh, drop through our tin roof, you know, in the, in the, in the officers' quarters. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it got exciting from time to time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. Yvette, if I were writing your biography, what scene would you want to be first in the book? Where is it and how old are you? And I was nine. And I was on the Queen Elizabeth, not the, not the QE2, but the original, the original Queen Elizabeth, mm -hmm. in January of 1962. Mm -hmm. And we left, my mom and I left New York and sailed to Cherbourg to meet my father, who was in France. Mm -hmm. um, in August of 61, the Berlin Wall was built. We had orders to go to France, but they stopped what they called concurrent travel. And after three months without my dad, my mom said, what if we just go? Mm. What if we just go as civilians? They mm -hmm. can't stop us. And so we booked passage on the Queen Elizabeth. My mom loved to go across the ocean on, on, a, on the ship. Mm -hmm. And it was a fascinating journey. And I can remember she took me up on deck to see the Statue of Liberty as we left New York Harbor. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were telling everyone to go down and do your lifeboat drill, find your lifeboats. My mom mm -hmm. said, come, you've got to see this. And we went to see the Statue of Liberty as we sailed out. And then to arrive in France five days later um, and meet my dad, who we'd been apart for about six months altogether. 
um, that passage, that five days of like suspended between here and there mm -hmm. with only the ship. Mm -hmm. And it was quite rough. We had a couple of, a couple of days when the swells were pretty big mm -hmm. and they put up the ropes that you had to hang on to as you, you know, your chairs are bolted to the floor so you can't mm -hmm. move closer. Um, it was to me an eye-opening adventure mm -hmm. and I've never forgotten it. I've mm -hmm. never forgotten it. Uh, when we arrived at Cherbourg, the tide was out. So we had to take tenders. We had to take a little, a little like a tugboat into mm -hmm. the, um, into the harbor. Mm -hmm. um, the Elizabeth had, she had, she had to lay off, off mm -hmm. quite a ways out. Mm -hmm. And um, I've never forgotten that. And I think as an, as a, as a biography, to me, it would be the stepping off point. Um, just like arriving in France, I was brand new to that country, mm -hmm. um, new to the language, new to everything. And it was almost as though I imagined now as a grown up, as an adult, mm -hmm. that's what immigrants felt coming west. Yeah. That must have been their feeling when they stepped off in the barns at the harbor in New York or on Ellis Island. I want to read a poem of yours, Yvette, a poem that uh, I, I like a lot. I think it's an amazing poem called Skies by Tiepolo. Um, Tiepolo, tell me about Tiepolo. Tiepolo, um, a painter, a Renaissance painter, um, who um, I believe he had a brother who painted and a son as well. And I'm not even sure of the one, I don't know if it's Giacomo is his first name, but he was well known for doing uh, interior design at royal palaces in Vienna, uh, for the Habsburgs uh, in Vienna and in Madrid. And um, the poem that you're refer referencing um, takes place in the Royal Palace at Madrid. That's how it A poem by Yvette Wietz Flotten, uh, Skies by Tiepolo. Maybe it was because he was a foreigner too, cast upon Spain by chance, fortune, an enticement too good to pass up. Maybe it was his name, how it rolled from the tour guide's tongue onto mine, Tiepolo, mixing word sounds like tippler, dancing with stipple, rounded out by a rolling O. However it came about, Tiepolo fell upon me from the ceilings of Madrid's royal palace like a sheet of wet silk. His skies dropped straight down, skies of orange and pink, voluptuous skies moving from mauve to salmon, golden skies soaking up a blood orangish red, corners muting to a smoky blue, a blue almost too perfect, fit only for throne rooms and autumn. I stood agape beneath his canopies of color, dumb snapped by the silent smoldering palette the artist revealed to me alone, it seemed, while the others traipsed out behind the guide, Germans and Brits and movie camera toting Americans. I lingered silent and alone beneath those panoplies of dazzle. I never shook the benchmark to which I have pressed in judgment every sunset sky of the rest of my life. It's a gorgeous poem. Thank you. How old were you when you looked at how old were you when you looked at Tiepolo? I would have been twenty. Uh-huh. Twenty years old. Yes. Well, perhaps uh, perhaps 19, but no more, no more than 20. So you gave up on painting at that point and decided to become a poet. Uh, I, well, <laughs> I, love, I love art. I love art. And uh, when I went to school in Madrid, I had a wonderful art teacher, a Jesuit priest named mm -hmm. Padre de Juan. And he would say, choose one painting, go to the Prado, stand in front of it, and become its friend. And I would do what he said, mm -hmm. 
there's no reason to go to every painting in a museum, but choose one or two and mm -hmm. learn them. And uh, that, that is what kind of happened to me with the ceiling of the Royal Palace. Mm -hmm. it, I can't hardly tell you what else was there, yeah. but the ceilings stuck in my mind. Mm -hmm. Poetry's always, always kind of been there in the bag. <laughs> okay. Tito, I want to read a poem of yours and, um, and then have you tell us a little bit about it. I've never come across a poem with Richard Browdigan in it before. I used to read Richard Browdigan and uh, I admired his, his work back when I was in college. I may have imitated him a little bit, so that makes the, the poem even more vital to me, but uh, I'm, I'm entranced by it and, and, uh, and uh, mystified by it, so I look for you to tell me about it. A poem entitled Haunting Bolinas. I visit Richard Browdigan's house in Bolinas, California, on the windy, wet coast north of San Francisco. I stay in the house at night where Richard exploded his brains with a 12-gauge shotgun. A woman comes by each night, stands in the dimly lit walkway outside the glass entry door, looks at me in the front hall, her sad eyes asking me a question I do not understand, and I am afraid to answer the door because I know I do not belong in Richard Brodigan's house. She opens the door with a key, lets herself in, stands in the amber entry, and tells me her name, Ianthi. You do not belong in this house, she tells me because you do not own a Remington pump action and you don't drink anymore and you would never leave your daughters the way my father left me. This is the poem that holds me, the reader, in suspense from the beginning to the end. And yeah. I want to know, is it true? I want to know how much is true? I want to know what that last line means. Um, well, I read Watermelon Sugar in the 1970s. And then um, I forgot about it. I went on about my life. And then again, then in the 90s, one time sitting down for dinner, out of nowhere, the first lines of Watermelon Sugar came to my mind. In Watermelon Sugar, the deeds are done and done again, as my life is done in Watermelon Sugar. I don't know what it means, but it just is so darn beautiful. And, and it hit me right in the middle of dinner. I said, what? I have to write, and I did, mm -hmm. and I've never written anything that good, I don't think, yet, mm -hmm. but it inspired me, and uh, then I started reading uh, all of his books, and then ran across Iantha uh, Brodigan's uh, memoir called You Can't Catch Death, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she, um, she uh, 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 inspired me uh, to think about it more. Essentially, the poem came to me in a dream, and I wrote down what I dreamed. Mm -hmm. And as for the uh, last line, I, I, I just, I think having read her book, how very sad it is to be a child of someone who committed suicide, and. Um, uh, it was not with Remington pump action, though. That was a little bit of poetic license. Mm. And uh, I have three daughters, three wonderful daughters, and a stepdaughter, um, and a stepson surviving. And uh, 
I, uh, I just wanted to make my pledge that I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So. I certainly Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it, uh, Yvette's poem and also your, your kind words about mine. Well, I like, I like poems, um, uh, not as an absolute thing, but I like poems that um, from the very beginning you know where you are and uh -huh. do in this, in this poem. The fact that it, you tell me it's a dream doesn't change the reality right. of yeah. it for, yeah. for me. But yeah. you, know, you know where you are and you know what this is about. Yeah. So each of you responded to our, our <laughs> invitation to write a poem about the pandemic. And uh, why don't I ask you, Tito, to go first, if you have a copy of your poem there. I do. I do. Your poem, The Night John Prine Died. Did you ever meet John Prine? No, I saw him in concert. Uh, two, maybe three times. Mm -hmm. uh, I never had a chance to, to, to meet him. I've met some of those people, but yeah. you know, the, the entertainers that uh, mm -hmm. close to so many people's hearts, but not him. He was a hero of everybody who met him, I think, everybody who listened yeah. to his songs. Well, you, you, you get a strong sense in his performances of his, his empathy and, and his uh, really uh, down-to-earth sensibility. Mm -hmm. you know, he was a workman. He was a survivor. Yeah. And he was not a bad guitarist. Uh, not at all, but I, I think <laughs> lyrics are really what, what, what made him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Read us the poem, if you would be so good. The night John Prine died. Mid-pandemic, we walked nearly vacant streets, she and I. It's April 7th, and the sun prepares to take our big city blue sky to China. A few long-shadowed men and women near here, over there, across the evening street, move purposefully, gracefully, safely. Polite, nervous ghosts in face masks, remembered now in slow motion. Dreamwalkers, avoiding dreamwalkers. Artists performing an apocalyptic dance never seen before, never danced before. Sometime after our return, after the news on Channel 5, but before Jeopardy, John Prine dies, ventilator intubated in Nashville, Tennessee. Novel coronavirus complications killed him, they say. Pneumonia purchased his lungs like soggy fog, too much for his surgery weakened body, his hip ripped open to replace a bone. In this great quarantine of 2020, a new surreal world surrounds us. An unfamiliar reality upends our days. We wear face masks colored like Joseph's robe, carry hand sanitizer and alcohol wipes and abhor touching anything not our own. John Prine falls like a shooting star on a supermoon night. We hold hands, stare at the floor, she and I. That's a gorgeous poem, Tudor. Thank you very much. Thank you so and much. Well, how did that come to you, that poem? Well, it's interesting because uh, my wife and I had taken a, a walk trying to, you know, get some exercise. And, and at, we live in a rather dense community uh, on Capitol Hill here. And uh, 
it just it struck me how there were no cars on the street or very few maybe a car every five minutes and everyone was just avoiding everyone it was like uh pinballs in slow motion going around the streets and and, and uh, people walking on the in the street and and avoiding each other by walking around cars and and I think that was the first day it really struck me how gigantic this experience is. And I knew I was going to write a poem because I was struck so deeply emotionally and intellectually just by that scene on the street. Mm. And then I came home and, and turned on the news and uh, there you go. It's, it's the rest of the poem was was uh, all over the internet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this great quarantine of 2020, the new surreal world surrounds us. An unfamiliar reality spends our days. Yeah. Yvette, I love your poem. Thank you. I admire you for writing it. The reader in me uh, wants to know um, if this is true, but you don't have to answer that. But I will. Um, my poetry is very autobiographical. Okay. And often things that have happened to me um, out of the blue um, will suddenly uh, spark something else because I can either see the similarity or the despair, the despairs. And um, in this case, a conversation that I had with another poet who was um, saying all, uh, much, much like Tito, um, this is changing us. This is, uh, this is something that we have never experienced before. And in the back of my mind, the bell went off and said, oh no, no, everybody has had a moment mm. like this. Okay. And it came to me immediately. Okay. And I started it, um, with something that really happened for those uh, it's interesting we have uh, washington here um mm -hmm. in common with with tito um shall i read can i Please. go ahead go writing it out caught in a sudden nasty squall on puget sound we had no choice but to write it out our 16 foot runabout nearly swamping in every gray swell years later we hung on in a basement southwest corner as winds whipped our Midwest town to shreds. This time, it's going to be a harder trial, a much longer trek, a slog against an enemy without sound or sign, a blind and nervy war. Yet, who hasn't faced their own personal quarantine? A bed rest pregnancy a chemo sequestration, months separated for work or military mission, days to weeks to months apart, given to a larger thing, self-imposed, self-accepted, all for a greater goal. We know how to meet this test of patience with patient trials and calm resolve. This is no shrieking summer storm, but a long sober season that must wend its darkest course. For us, it's recouping time, mending time for harness and traces, to right our wheels and saddle up, to strap on spurs for the tough trail ahead. That is a tough poem. So you brought up the subject at the end there, Yvette, so I'm going to ask you about it. For us, it's recouping time, mending time for harness and traces to Here, clean I think ourselves. You're kind of off, uh, off screen. Yes, I don't know what happened here. Oh, uh, for some reason here, I felt like this going. Okay, <laughs> I, will come, I will come back. I apologize for interrupting. That's no, that's quite all right. That's what quite all right. Mean? For us, it's recouping time, mending time for harness and traces to right our wheels and saddle up to strap on spurs 
for the rough trail ahead. So my question is really that is, what comes next? How are we going to get through this thing? And what's your ambition at this at this point? Well, my ambition is I'm in the process of uh, finishing a novel uh, that I've written for years. I've been writing it for a long time, and I need to finish it. Um, I also have a couple of collections of poetry that are looking for homes. Um, and uh, I like to write every day. I try to write something every day. I keep a journal. And actually, um, I started keeping a journal uh, a few years ago when I was going through chemo myself. And I found it was the only way to keep track of what, I was, what I'd done, what I was doing day by day. Otherwise, I would have weeks that I had no, con no conscious memory of. Mm -hmm. um, and those journals have turned out to be um, a great uh, source of reflection, things to write about. So what I want to do is uh, continue to write, continue to write good poetry. Um, I like to send it out. I submit it here and wherever I can. Um, but I try to also write honestly and uh, about real life. Um, John Prine um, I hate to say this, but I really didn't know his work well. And when he passed away, I started listening to him. A friend of mine recommended things to listen to. And I love his, his common man voice and his love of lyrics, the way he puts things together. I kind of admire the, the straightforwardness of it. And I like to write like that. So tell me about the novel. Does somebody die in it? Does somebody shoot somebody? Do people oh, it's fall in a, love? Is the uh, well, actually, it's, it's, it started as a mystery and then became an adventure story and now has become a love story. So, uh, yes, somebody I'm sure will die, but I don't know who yet. <laughs> okay. Kill them gently. I will. Very gently. You know, you and I are uh, roughly the same age. What's your plan? What's your ambition here? Well, I, I'm working on a collection that's about two-thirds done called 50 Ways to Leave Your Life, So Far So Good. <laughs> and, um, and I want to get that done. I'd like to see it get published. Uh, and I know that if I'm not writing, I feel like I'm uh, uh, out of sorts. I, I'm, I'm failing, yep. you know. I have to write, even if it's lousy writing, I have to do that or I don't like myself. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the other goal, I think, is that uh, I want to live as long as I can. Sure. Because I like hanging out with the woman I'm married to. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. And, 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 and I mean, it's just such a wonderful experience to, to, to be with her. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, um, that and the children. Um, uh, she has uh, three, uh, 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 two now, uh, and I have three, and they all have families, and um, uh, it's a wonderful experience to see the next generation, you know, at work. Um, you know, uh, one's a veterinarian, one's a fisheries biologist for the Yakima Nation, um, you know, one works with... Um, Safeway and another works with uh, T-Mobile, mm -hmm. so it's it's and one's an insurance executive, and so it's it's really it's really fun with all those grandkids and things. Not all of them have grandkids, but uh, it's time to pay attention to life. That's my feeling. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, good luck with that. And in case nobody has told you up till now, uh, wash your hands regularly. <laughs> Don't touch yeah. your face and um, keep your distance. Keep your distance, yeah. except from the woman who you married. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you, Yvette. Thank you. All Thank the best you. to you. Thank you. Thank I enjoyed you. both of your presence so Thank much. You. Thank you. Judith yes. Midas and Yvette Flop. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.